hi everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for those of you who are waiting for the wardrobe for coming. Uh, my name is Lech and I am the guy who created the stopoffer.com website where we try. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> where we try to um, help people doing the architectural visualization and let's say design uh, in general to, to have it easier to do with Blender. So what you can see right now is my, my course coming out in December 2018, which I want to apologize for a, almost one year delay in preparation <laughs> of this course. Um, yeah, it took me much more time than I thought it's gonna take, but I think I'm pretty proud of how it came out. And in case you would like to ask us any questions about the course or about the Chocofour, or if you're one of our clients maybe, uh, you can approach me or my team. If you wanna uh, hate us for anything, just please do it, for the, like focus on them. And if you wanna thank us, just come to me. And yeah, so what I would like to share today, since it's a little bit more uh, open environment, I was thinking about sharing uh, three tips I could give anyone when it comes to architectural visualization. So how to, maybe not necessarily make better renderings, but how to optimize your work a little bit more. Or I would, I can also say these are the three principles I'm always kind of using in my works when we are wor working with the clients and customers. So let me just share a few more things that we've done. So all of the works you can see right now, uh, they were created in Blender and Cycles. Um, what can I say? I mean, I think it's possible to create a high quality work in totally free and open source software, which wasn't a case some time ago. I think it was already possible many years ago, but it was, wasn't all, like, you don't always have the opportunity to show what Blender is capable of. But what we are trying to do, what we are striving to do for the past few years is to convince our clients, convince our business partners that we don't have to stick to the commercial 3D apps and we can use Blender for, at least for doing the architectural interior stuff, what we are focusing on mostly right now. But we also wanna move to the exteriors. Um, Hopefully next year I'll be able to share more on that. But now let's just jump into those three tips I would like to share. So I have prepared this simple scene and my presentation will be a live work. So in case anything crashes like last year or something doesn't work, uh, yeah, we'll try to do the damage control. So I have created this very simple scene and one of the things, um, I, would I would say that's the most important thing when you work on the architectural visualization are the glass materials, especially the glass materials that you put into the window openings. In every, almost every interior scene, you're gonna have an exterior light source. And in most cases, as we can see, you have a glass in the window openings. So I have prepared this uh, simple world setup here, but let's just ignore it for a moment. I will get back to, to what's happening here. Uh, as it works, uh, the default way this setup works is just what you would have when plugging in a regular HDR map. And yeah, let me just go on and do it as I would do normally. So uh, in order, in order to create a glass panel, I would simply start with a cube, just scale it like that, so it has some, so it has some physical uh, thickness. Then just adjust it to the opening. Uh, sometimes I'm just pressing Control A to apply the scale to the object. And we begin with creating the glass material. So if you're new to Blender, 
and you're watching some tutorials, the tips you will probably get is setting up the transmission to one, color to 100% white, reducing the roughness here, and just hitting the render button, and here's, here's your glass. But what you've probably noticed, we've lost the shadows that were caused by, HD, by the HDR map. If I hide the glass panels, the shadows are visible again. So that's very confusing to a lot of people because, well, I've created a glass material. Where are my shadows? Why isn't it working out of the box as the principal BSDF shader should work? Well, in 3D graphics, uh, I would say glass is actually one of the most tricky materials to recreate correctly because it really depends, uh, the approach you should have to the glass it really depends on how you're gonna use it, what kind of object you're trying to recreate. So with window openings, I would call it, and some of the rendering engines have this type of shader, I would call this material, material a thin glass. And a thin glass material doesn't necessarily represent the IOR settings that you have here because what happens quite often in Blender, maybe I will actually show it. So let's say you set up your background view uh, in the 3D viewport, then you add a glass panel, you set up the IOR settings as someone on the forum rec recommended you to do for the glass, but then when you render it, you can see the view behind the window distorts or shifts or moves around and this is what the IOR setting does. But when you compare the results to the real life windows, this effect is barely noticeable. So yeah, how should we approach the glass? Um, so a little bit more advanced users will tell you, well man, you just have to add the shader, uh, glass, reconnect it, of course, reduce the roughness. Let's leave the IOR as 1.3. And you need to do this trick with a mixed shader. Um, transparency. And now it's uh, the most advanced part, which is the light path node. So you should connect it as a shadow ray input here, and voila, you have your glass material, but I, I wouldn't call it an uh, incorrect solution because it does the job done, but from my experience, the, there is much more optimized and better working solution which can uh, cut your render times even by 40%, and this is something I'm sharing in the course, which I just wanna show you here. So this is the scene we are working on in the course, and what you see right now is a default result with a glass shader created the way I just showed you in the node setup. And this is how it looks like the way I'm doing it. It's not a black magic or anything. I will just show you in a second. But in my opinion, the, the, the left hand result is much better because it gives you this more natural brightness. And when I was preparing the course, as you can read down below here, the original render time for this frame was 27 minutes, 30 seconds, and with the glass optimization, it was cut down to 16 minutes, 30 seconds. So it's almost a 40% improvement. And I would say, yeah, if I was to give a one tip on how to, what should I do to make my uh, interior or architectural visualization workflow better in Blender, I would single-handedly say, do, do apply this one trick because it will save you a lot of time in all of the projects. So, as I said, this setup is not incorrect, it does the job, but what not everyone is aware of, here within the object settings uh, in Cycles, we have the visibility settings. And here, we also have quite similar things as in the light path node. The difference is, if we disable them here, they work on the object level of the glass panel and not on the shader level. That means if we, let's say, disable this object to all those light uh, or ray visibility settings, Cycles will treat it as it's hidden. So it's ba it basically works as I press H here in the viewport, but just for the diffuse transmission and let's say shadow passes. So the difference we have 
is not that big. And with HDR, usually you just get 15 to 20 percent better render times. But with more complex setup, as we have here in my course, where we have the like the normal environment uh, emission in the background, plus the area lamps, plus the sun lamp that which causes those shadows here on the left, uh, the render times can be improved even up to 40 percent. So I would say that's the first and most important uh, tip I would give anyone. Actually, for a thin glass shader like the one we use here in the window, um, this is something I'm not saying is necessary, but instead of using the glass uh, BSDF and the light path, I'm personally in some projects going even further and using the normal glossy BSDF with reduced roughness, let's say, 0 0.01, and I just try to rec recreate the Fresnel effect. Um, by the way, if you're a beginner to, to this kind of stuff, I'm sorry, but this year I wanted to show a little bit more advanced things, so uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we'll have time to answer them, and you can also approach us and ask whatever you want. Like, what's my, who's my favorite Formula One driver, and what's my video game, and so on, so. Um, yeah, actually it should work. I don't know why it's so reflective right now. Um, let me go back. So the opening we see here is the second window, just, just to show you what's happening. We have two openings, but I will now try to totally uh, reduce those reflections. Hmm. Okay. Like this, right? Thanks. <laughs> exactly. So now with this curve, I'm able, I don't know if you're able to see it on the beamer, but at, let's say here within this uh, area, we are getting this pretty realistic uh, light highlight reflection within the window which wasn't even visible in the default principled BSDF shader and with just with just this one knob we are able to uh, increase the reflections in the glass because again if you look at those let's call them thin thin glass elements in reality you only see the reflections the glass has you don't see any glass distortion as in the glass of water so and since these are the like usually quite big areas of your rendering, letting the light into the interior scene, I would say that's a yeah, pretty important thing to keep an eye on. Again, I'm not saying this is the way you should do the thin glass shader. This is the way I quite often do it because even if I increase the reflections this high, with those settings disabled here, this doesn't affect the illumination in my scene at all. So. Of course, it's not physically correct, but sometimes you're just looking for this one particular look. Let's say you're, you're trying to recreate from a photo, and for some reason it looks like this in the photo. And yeah, with just a traditional kind of, let's call it uh, physical approach, you won't be able to achieve that. So um, yeah, let me just leave this shader as it is right now. And I'm gonna move to the second tip which is this beginner's only node setup for the world. Um, what it actually does, and I know it looks complex, but it's, it's not. And to make it a little bit more approachable, <laughs> to make it a bit more approachable, we want to release a free add-in that will just pack all of those uh, lines into a very neat solution where you can just play around with the sliders. But um, let me show you a rendering output. This is a default rendering output from the scene I'm just showing you. So we have an HDR map, which is correctly done as it casts this nice uh, sharp light and sharp shadows. But I don't know about you, what I don't like about the HDR uh, illumination is that it usually in Blender generates those very hot, uh, dark uh, diffuse illumination within the interior. So you can try to 
fight with it, fix it with the uh, color, um, the color management settings here. But what I also found interesting, you can actually adjust the HDR map within the Blender itself. So here, I'm trying to. This is this is the result showing you how it would look like with when I doubled the HDR map strength, the emission strength. But this is how it looks like when I, if I could double the diffuse illumination only within the scene. So that's the difference. I'm not increasing the strength of the HDR map at all. I'm just increasing the strength of the diffuse bounces. This is how it looks like if I could desaturate the diffuse bounces. So we are getting rid of this bluish tint, which is obviously not when, you, when we look behind the window, right, we don't see that much of the blue color as we see in the diffuse bounces here. So it would be cool if we could desaturate them. So this is what's happening in this image. Um, here I'm increasing the diffuse bounces even more. So with the same exact render time, with the same exact um, HDR image, we are able to have this picture instead of this one. So it's what this setup does, and I just wanna show you how it's done. I mean, I'm gonna recreate some of those settings here, but let me just demonstrate uh, how it works in real life. So, the render times, um, I hope from what I tested, we are gonna go with the 30% resolution, so it's gonna be around one minute. Um, yeah, let's just render the default view we have right now, so we have a point of reference. and. If you want to ask any questions in the meantime, uh, feel free to do it. If not, we are going to sit here in dead air and, and wait. And not to keep you hanging, the third tip already, I will point, uh, say what I'm gonna show. It's, it will be how I'm extracting some of the render passes from Blender and then combining them later in Photoshop. Um, the things that I'm showing you right now, this is also part of the course. Uh, actually, the HDR setup is a part of the advanced chapter of the course, but yeah, uh, just letting you know this is something uh, I just wanna share totally for free as well. So this is a default input we have right here. And as I mentioned, I mean, maybe let's look at it for a moment. I will tell you my approach if I'm working on a project like this. So looking at that image, I can already tell I would like to have much more brightness within the scene itself, not just in the center area. I can try doing this just by increasing the gamma settings here in the color management. So let's set it to 2.2, as some people say it's a standard for this kind of uh, setup, and let's maybe try playing around with contrast. So it doesn't look bad, but one thing I've noticed when illuminating scenes with HDR maps is in the highlight areas here, for example, we are getting, you can see the tone difference, right? And normally, when you look outside, probably from the physical point of view or physical approach, the values, the brightness we have represented here is totally related to the uh, sky brightness. But from my experience, when you do renderings, it looks much better when the highlights are a little bit brighter and a little bit more desaturated than we have here because you can see uh, this area has this bluish tint as well. So how we can fix that. Well, in my setup, we are able to play around with the glossy value and glossy saturation. So let's decrease the saturation by 50% and let's increase the glossy value by two. So you can already see within this area those highlight or let's call it the old school way, the specular reflections, they look much better as in the previous example. Perhaps they are too bright 
So let's set them up to those values and let's re-render uh, this image again so we have a clear comparison of what changed. Or to save you from dead air, we can stare at this setup once more. Um, actually, I can add a few two cents. Um, as you can see, I have two image inputs. And what I'm testing out here, because it's still in a test phase, is having a separate uh, HDR input for the sky and a separate input for the reflections, a background, and so on. Because, and I'll be honest, some people ha keep this as a golden rule that you should always illuminate the, sc il illuminate the scenes with the sky only because the ground, the grass, and all those elements don't cast any light, so they shouldn't contribute to the scene. I already did at least 10 HDR setup tests with this separated and with just this input, and the differences are sometimes very minor, so I'm still not sure if I'm doing something incorrectly here, or if it really doesn't matter that much. But getting back here, now when we compare those two results, um, let me just see if it's visible. Yeah, it is visible. So I don't know about you, but I like the second one mo more, and I'm just gonna stick to it. No, but honestly, I think it really looks better. Usually when you look around, if we took a picture of something, the actual picture which captures physical light would probably have this bluish tint as well, but the way we perceive things with our eyes uh, simplify a lot of things. So I think this, this uh, version looks a little bit more natural, but let's keep going. Let's say I would like to increase this nice caustic effect that happens here. So I can also do that within this setup by increasing the transmission value. So let's launch a live preview again. Let's focus on this area and let's increase those values by four, for example. So you can now see we get this nice brightness here. It also uh, cover it takes some of the color tint with itself and we can also desaturate it here. So to save us a little bit more time on the rendering, I'm gonna apply all of the other fixes. So yeah, the most important one I was talking about is the diffuse brightness. So if we move up here, uh, we have the diffuse value, which is separated from the entire setup. Let's increase it by three. And you can now see the scene becomes brighter without uh, changing any of the other uh, settings. So if we, if we did that, just by increasing the general strength of the HDR input, it will affect everything uh, with the same level. So the, the reflections, the light uh, beam here on the ground would also increase. Then we would have to play around with those settings and the final output would be more or less the same. So that's why we need to be able to separate those properties of, a, of an image uh, from each other and fine tune them independently. So yeah, let's keep the diffuse as three. Let's desaturate the diffuse bounces. So you can now see they got a little bit, they, they lost a little bit of this bluish tint. And what I also think is really missing in Blender right now, maybe in the, within the color management, maybe within the compositor, I'm not arguing on which level is something that we have in an, almost every camera, which is a color balance. So it will be nice to influence a general temperature of the image, because we can, we can capture a picture on a sunny day, but with a different color balance, the final output will be very cold and uh, totally not related to the actual um, lighting conditions. I don't say it's a good thing to, to, to capture it in, with an incorrect white balance, but it would be good to be able to adjust it. So within just a few clicks, I'm able to change the general temperature or general look and feel of the image. So 
let's set it up to something neutral like 5,500. And let's do the third rendering so we can compare this uh, starting result with the end result. So I think before it finishes, we can already start uh, noticing the difference, right? That we've lost this bluish uh, tint. I don't know if someone likes it. Um, I'm not criticizing, but usually you would like to, in architectural visualizations, you would like to keep the colors more neutr neutral and balanced. So yeah, just using the one and the same HDR map, I think we are getting much more natural results, much cleaner results here. We could also play around with the background image a little bit in this setup. But yeah, I'm not gonna show you that. But let me just focus on how it's actually done a little, a little bit more. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, it, it really is, uh, it's not a rocket science. So I will just copy this uh, base HDR map and the background emission and come back to our view here. So right now, again, we have this very default uh, setup here. And for example, I would like to influence the background view of this, of this rendering. So to do that, I'm gonna need a mix shader, another background shader, which is plugged in, which, which has my HDR image plugged in here. And I'm kind of, I, I can just add the uh, hue saturation node here. Then I'm combining these two and using the light path node to define uh, what's gonna be influenced by this setup I have here. So if I set it up to the camera ray, and by the way, now I'm gonna just see, yeah, this is the camera ray. Uh, is it or not? Sometimes you need to hide those glass elements and because they, yeah, okay, that was a camera ray anyway. I just hide the, the glass panel because sometimes you have to use the transmission ray since the light has to go through the transmissive uh, element first. But anyway, right now uh, with this very simple setup, I'm able to totally desaturate the background, increase its strength, mm, in change the hue. So step by step, just with the light path node that I have here, that I also have here in the center of the setup, I'm able to extract each one of the rendering properties and edit them independently. And I would say if you want to have more natural illumination in your scene, this is something you have to do. Uh, you don't have to create this uh, enorm enormous setup that I have did. As I mentioned, we want to pack it into a nice add-on so you can just play around with the sliders. But sometimes if something doesn't work in your rendering and you would, you're wondering how to fix that, uh, yeah, you can just do it using this simple setup here. So for example, if I just change the input to the diffuse ray, now you can see all those uh, walls got much brighter because this setup that I have here now only influences the light that bounces around the scene. So. What's also interesting, you can change the hue of that. You can actually do many crazy things with it. So yeah, I would say that's the second to the glass tip I would give anyone who'd like to quickly improve their ar architectural visualization looks. The third tip 
that saves probably the most time is the post-production, post-processing. So I'm gonna create a new Blender file for that. Go to the compositor. And that's also, I think, I, I would say it's worth knowing that when you render an image in Blender, you're, you, you don't have to lose it once you close Blender. If you save it, um, if you save it, wait, I think I need to do any kind of rendering here. If you save it as the OpenXR multi-layer file format, or maybe not necessarily multi-layer if you're not saving the uh, render passes, but when we go here and at least choose the OpenXR file format, this will prov save all of your rendering outputs uh, to the file so you can then load them back into Blender again if you want to keep on working with them, let's say the next day or something. Uh, if you want to include the render passes that can be selected here, uh, so again, I'm not, not gonna dig into all of that right now, but if you want to save any of those and keep on working with them in Blender later, just choose the OpenXR multi-layer file format here and everything will be saved to the file. So you're, you won't lose your uh, rendering progress or anything. So I'm gonna show you right now just another uh, tip, how I'm using some of the render, uh, render passes, render pass outputs to edit or to improve the final look of my rendering. Um, I'm just gonna add an image. And open my XR file. And by the way, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of the Blender compositor, so forgive me for not using any Node Wranglers or the add-ons. I'm just always trying to um, extract what I need from, from, from it and keep on moving uh, with the post-production in external applications like Photoshop or GIMP. I'm gonna show it how I'm doing it in Photoshop. So. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, what I, what I have here right now is the, uh, the raw output of a rendered scene that I had, which I can now come back to and edit. And the render passes, I would say are, at least for me, are the most important ones, are the shadow pass, which looks like this, ambient occlusion pass, which looks like that, and the glossy direct and indirect passes. I've included the other passes just to show you how many you can you can have. So, but I would say I'm all 90% of the time I'm I'm sticking to those four that I've just mentioned. The other passes that I, that I also include are the cryptomat passes, which allow me to separate individual elements I would like to save. So let's say we are going to focus on the shadow pass, and it's uh, very useful for increasing or improving the shadows in the final rendering, uh, except you need to get rid of those block, um, black areas. So in order to do that, we have to use the CryptoMat uh, node. And we can just plug in either the material inputs or the object inputs. Um, I think actually the material would, would work better for us, so let's do it. and. You don't necessarily have to plug all those in. I'm just doing it because I'm, I don't know, I'm weird. So anyway, right now, once we set this all up, we're able to generate this selection uh, input mask. And with those two buttons here, we are able to add things to our selection. So let me duplicate the viewer node just to preview the shadow pass once again. Uh, so I can clearly see I need to get rid of this area and this area and some of the other. Usually these are just the glass areas. So I'm gonna start clicking, uh, I'm gonna click this add button here and start 
adding each one of them to my selection. And right now, when I uh, choose the mat output here and plug it into the viewer node, I can see my selection mask. So I can now switch between these two uh, just to see what else am I missing. So it's definitely the oven area here and the lamps. I'm gonna reconnect the pick input again here. Click the add button and start adding those missing objects. And if I press the v, uh, Alt V key, I can zoom in. Uh, with Alt and middle mouse button, I can pan this uh, backdrop view. So step by step, I'm adding those items. And now, now I can see uh, that my mask is probably complete. So right now I need to combine this shadow pass with the mask I've created. And the way I'm doing it, um, and this is, this is where I'm getting lost every single time, so forgive me. Um, it's not alpha over, it's uh, alpha combine. Actually, I don't have to do it this way. I can actually just plug in the met input to the alpha here. So you can see uh, we still need to invert it. And to do this, I'm gonna use just the color invert node, which if I plug it in here, it adds the transparency to my shadow pass. So I can just double check if there are no black areas within it. There aren't. The way I'm saving those passes, I usually do it manually if I uh, hand, uh, hand pick the areas or hand mask out the areas of a render pass, then I'm saving it manually. You can also save all of the render passes automatically to the files if you, if you want to, but yeah, I'm usually doing it manually. So here within the rendering view, I just switch to the viewer node, and right now I'm able to save it as a separate file. So I just choose save as. Uh, I usually go with just the PNG 16-bit format with alpha channel. And since I already did that to save you time uh, with the other render passes, I'm just gonna show you how they look like. So this is the ambient occlusion pass with the same areas mask out. This is the glossy direct pass with the glass panels only masked out. This, this is the glossy indirect pass, which I'm using to increase the reflections of some of the elements. And, and yeah, and this is the shadow pass that I just showed you. And this is the raw rendering. So let's now see how far we can push the raw rendering using those four render passes. And by the way, what I'm gonna do in Photoshop right now can be also done in Blender. But in my opinion, uh, it's a really painful way through. So I just, from the practical approach, I just prefer to do it quicker in Photoshop. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just start with the shadow pass. I will drag and drop it, rasterize the layer, and the mix mode I'm using for ambient occlusion and shadow passes is the soft light. So once I do this, let me switch to the, um, yeah, so it's, so it's a bit more visible. So just by, the, by default, you can already see the difference we are getting some of the elements become more visible, let's say this uh, kitchen sink or faucet here. Sorry. And I'm very rarely using those render passes at 100% opacity, so usually I just go down to 50, 40%, not to overdo the effects. And I'm just leaving them like that then I keep on adding the other elements, and in the end, I'm fine tuning everything all together. So with the ambient occlusion pass, I can 
already tell it's a little bit too dark. Uh, but let me switch to the soft light anyway. Yeah, and if with 100% opacity it darkens my image to this level, I will just use the curves. So I'm pressing Control M shortcut, and I'm just gonna make this uh, render pass a little bit brighter. So with this applied, again, I'm decreasing the opacity by, four, by 60, 50%, and I'm just hiding and hiding the layers just to see if, if it works or not. The thing is very subjective, so I wouldn't say there is any like fixed rule which percentages of opacity should you use or not. It really, it's really very subjective. With the reflection passes, like the glossy um, direct pass that I've just imported, I'm using the screen uh, blending method. So once I add it, you can also see we are getting those nice reflections here in the highlights and this pass is, is limited to those highlight areas only. I would say from all the passes, I think this one is the most important one because uh, for some reason the 3D applications, I think they don't represent the highlight areas as we see them in real life. So if it's possible to boost them, I'm always trying to do that. And the final pass is the glossy, um, indirect pass. Again, I'm gonna use the screen blend mode for that. Here, I'm gonna go much lower with the opacity so we don't add that, that many reflections to those glass surfaces. And again, as with the ambient occlusion, I'm also able to uh, play around with the brightness of this lander, render pass. So if I think this, let's say, area is cut out, uh, or it, it brings too many reflections, I can just mm, simply adjust it with just a few clicks. So after packing those, all those render passes into one group, when I enable and disable all of them, we can see um, they influence our rendering quite a lot. Maybe we have a little bit too many highlights. But yeah, in order to have this effect from a raw rendering directly, I think we would need to spend extra few hours readjusting things, setting up the materials, re-rendering, etc. And with, with just those few clicks and by extracting the render passes from the raw rendering, we are able to do it much, we are able to do it much quickly and uh, not mentioning the, the freedom of adjustments we have right now. So, Again, I'm gonna go back to the beginning of my presentation. So these are the three tips I would give to anyone who would like to quickly, uh, let's say, jump to a higher level with their archi architectural stuff. So the first thing would be those glass uh, settings that I mentioned that can cut, up, cut your render times by 40, 20% and make your scenes much more believable. The second tip will be Adjusting the HDR map, so spending a few more minutes. Oh, sorry, I closed the scene. Sorry. <laughs> spending a few more uh, minutes with uh, trying to adjust the, the individual properties of the HDR illumination. And the third tip would be saving the render passes, individual render passes from your rendering and trying to combine them. Of course, this doesn't have to be done to, to every single rendering that you're producing, right? If you're doing some previews for your client and so on, you can just go on with, even with the JPEG file, file outputs to save time and to save uh, disk space <laughs> if, if that's your problem. But if you're creating a finalized image, if you have to deliver the highest quality, I would say this is the way to go, at least with the post-production. So saving the files as the OpenXR file format to be able to come back to them later in Blender to readjust the, the highlights, the tones, the way you want to, and to be able to extract all those render passes. So let me just actually finalize this picture. I'm gonna open my second Photoshop file, which is also included in the course, and I'm just gonna drag and drop the uh, color correction layers. And by the way, 
uh, how to set these two up, you can actually check on our YouTube channel because uh, I'm also trying to be active on YouTube. My uh, previous video, make your Blender renders look better. This is where I show how you can just do, how you can do the color grading and post-processing in Photoshop without any render passes. So in the end, you should be able to create those two pretty easy color adjustment layers. Actually, it's just, these are actually just the curves that increase the contrast of an image a little bit and the color balance that shift the tones a little bit more to the green spectrum. I don't, yeah, I think it's not even visible uh, on the screen. So let's just open the image and one more time compare the end result with, with the raw rendering. So I, I think, at least I think the, the end result is much better. And we did this without any extra rendering or 3D adjusting effort. But what's really great about Blender, we are, maybe th this is just a side note, because oftentimes people say Blender is not ready for professional work. In my opinion, if you're able to extract all this raw information from a rendering and keep on working with that later and adjust it, to me that's a, one of the things that define a totally professionally ready application. So if you're ever wondering should you switch to Blender or should you use Blender for architectural stuff, for professional work in general, not only architectural things, my answer is yes, because I'm doing this since 2012. And for the past five years, I would say 99.5% percent of the projects that we did as a company was Blender only projects. And these were architectural related uh, jobs. So uh, don't give up. You probably might have a question, what happens if a client sends me the 3ds Max files or Cinema 4D files and I work with Blender? You just ask them for OBJs. This is what we do. Or for the Alembic file format because it also saves quite a lot of scene properties so you don't have to re rework things yourself. And yeah, and you just keep going and don't give up and you're gonna be able to do it with Blender. So thank you for listening. I really hope it was informative to a certain level. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, if you want to talk to us, again, I'm together with my team, so we'll be glad to answer any questions that you would have. Thank you.